Okay. Welcome everybody. Hey, thank you so much um, for joining us tonight. And we've got a quorum. So I believe we will uh, call the meeting to order and do roll call at this point. So please um, say aye if you are here. Um, Ramiro Cabanillas Ledesma. And Ramiro, Ramiro called in and said he wasn't going to be able to attend tonight, but Lindsay Correa. Here. Um, Patrick Huber. Here. Trisha Price. Patricia Price. Here. Great. Trisha. I'm here. Um, Emma is on vacation, so Emma's not here. Marc Bossier. I'm here. Although there's a little weird thing because under my picture, I see Sarah Jong-Si and then Marc Vessier is somebody else, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that is interesting. Denise I don't happen. know what happened, but... Um... <laughs> That's weird. And you can't change it? I have no, I've no power on that. I can change it on my end. I think Denise can change it for you guys. <laughs> Hope so. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, and then our our brand new um, alternate board member is um, Sarah. And Sarah, would you please let me know how to pronounce your last name properly? Yes. Hi, uh, this is Sarah Gunsey. Gunsey, perfect, great. Yes. And there'll be some time set aside for you to introduce yourself um, later, which is great. Um, all right. And now we move on to item number two, the approval of our agenda for tonight. Are there any, um, are there any corrections or comments on the agenda for tonight's meeting? Okay. Nope. All right. Um, what I need now then is a motion for approval and a second. Okay, I move to approve the agenda. Is there a, a second? second? Okay. Was that was that Lindsay? Yes. Perfect. And um, and then we'll just take a, a voice vote. And all in favor of the agenda, the approving the agenda for tonight. Please say aye. 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 Anybody, anybody not want to approve the agenda for tonight? Perfect, it's unanimous. Okay, moving on to item number three, brief announcements from our staff and any commissioners and then um, city council liaison for tonight. I have a, a couple announcements. Um, I think I sent everybody a, an email about the um, open space survey, the, out, the outreach survey, uh -huh. um, and it's still live. It's been up since October 15th and it'll come down on November 15th. But um, so we've been, um, you know, advertising that as, as widely as we can through various newsletters and all the city's social media. And I just wanted to let everybody know that as of last Thursday, so I didn't get any update today, but as of last Thursday, we had 163 respondents, which is pretty good. Nice. There's still a couple more weeks to go. And I've had maybe um, five people email me to be added to the open space listserv. And of those, about four of them, you know, also were willing to um, volunteer. So we did have a few people there at the end who uh, took advantage of, of that. And one, also one person was interested in the commission and uh, how to apply to be on the commission. So we've got a little bit of interest there. So that was good. Um, I also wanted to um, let everybody know that we are trying to do some kind of ribbon cutting ceremony for the South Fork Preserve um, public accessibility improvements. 
probably, you know, we're shooting for maybe early December sometime, um, maybe Friday, December 3rd. The thing is though, it is going to be uh, during the day, like in the morning on a weekday. So I know sometimes that's hard for um, everybody's schedule. So you, it's not mandatory, you don't have to be there. Um, but um, once I get the date nailed down, um, I can send out an email and let you know, but I wanted to at least get on your radar that I'm gonna try to do something with the city council. And I invited um, yeah, our grant contact from the state and I reached out to the Yochidihi Nation to see if somebody from um, the tribe could come as well because we collaborated with them on one of the interpretive panels. So, um, so anyway, uh, you know, you could put a tentative down for Friday, December 3rd, but I, I, it's not official yet. But um, anyway, I just wanted to get that on everybody's radar. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to mention that um, the EIR addendum for the Davis Innovation and Sustainability Campus DISC. Um, I checked in with um, Sherry Metzger today about when that everybody thinks that might be done. And the, the date that I got was targeting December 1st that it might be done. Um, and, uh, but it's not for sure. And so basically what's gonna happen, so in our meeting is December 6th. So um, if we did have it, I'm, we can talk about this later in the agenda when we're talking about the agenda, but I'm just letting you know that um, um, it's going to be posted on the city on the city's website and there'll be a place if, if the commission decides they don't want to agendize it um, there'll be a place that people can go onto the website and send their comments in before the planning commission meeting in January and the city council meeting in February um, and so um, we can talk about that a little bit more um, when we talk about the agenda and whether or not um, the commission wants to put the addendum to the EIR on the agenda for um, maybe, I guess you could also potentially do it in um, January if you wanted to do some, get comments in before the city council meeting in February. So anyway, I just wanted to let you know about that timing as well. So those are my announcements. Um, I'll make a I'll make a brief announcement. This is Carrie. I after our last meeting, I had a um, I sent a letter off to the city council members and and basically expressed kind of the same frustration to to them that I did in our meeting about just the timeline for our commission on reviewing the disc twenty twenty two um, you know uh, revised project and scope and everything and just you know let them know that we we got through it it wasn't really easy for us and we would have really it would have really been helpful to have just even a couple of extra a little bit more than a couple of extra weeks just one more commission meeting would have been helpful and um dan carlson who's on the subcommittee on the city council with gloria partita our mayor um reached out to me and and um you know apologized basically and and said that it, you know, we just happened to be the first one that went. It wasn't a, wasn't any, um, you know, wasn't any rhyme or reason. It just, our commission meeting happened to be the first one that was coming up. And so we kind of got, we kind of got stuck as, uh, as kind of guinea pigs for the, how the process was going to work. And we had a nice long talk and I reiterated to him the, the several things that we had whittled down that were still concerned to us and mentioned to him a few, few of the other topics that we did discuss that night that we didn't really take up in depth or have the time to discuss thoroughly and vote on, uh, including in that email, but just topics that came up, specifically the ones about the disconnect between the definition of open space in the city's general plan and the open space um, that it's used for developments like this and how gathering spaces for people are considered are can, are called open space as well, and and how that you know those that different that definition can be a can be problematic I think going forward, and then just concerns that we we all shared about about uh, more 
more um, uh, consideration for soils and more consideration for gardening areas and stuff around around the housing elements. Um, and and he listened and he was it was very nice to be able to just sort of just say that those those things those topics came up and were discussed and to, to just let them know um, that we, we didn't have a chance to discuss them thoroughly or take a vote or anything like that. But they're, it, they're issues that I think commission members feel strongly about, will feel strongly about going forward. Um, so that was, that was nice. Are there any other announcements from anybody on the commission? And um, I don't see that our, City Council liaisons are here, so I don't see Will or Lucas on tonight, but um, anybody else on the commission? Okay, yeah, if not, I oh. go ahead, Lindsay. I can just share that there are a number of sort of initiatives at the state level going on for the state's climate um, adaptation strategy that's open for public comment now, as well as I think the natural and working land strategy that the state is working on. So just if those are of interest to anyone, sort of peripherally related to some of the things that we do here, but those efforts are open for public comment and there's been a number of sort of workshops planned for some of those efforts. Nice. Okay, I don't see any more hands up or anything. So let's move on to item. Um, five, our, or excuse me, item four, our public comment period. This is a, a you know, time during our meeting where any member of the public can, can talk to the commission and address us on any issues or matters um, that are not on the agenda tonight, but that are of concern to them or of interest to them. And um, I just wanted to open it up. We have two, two public attendees tonight. And if either one of you would like to, to um, make make a comment or ask a question at this point that's not not about anything on the agenda, feel free at this time to raise your hand using the icon at the bottom of your screen. I think those are they are both here for the cannery farm item six B. Hopefully, hi Ira, Ira and Vern. <laughs> cool. All right. Um, with that, let's move on to our consent agenda then for tonight. Um, we only have our um, our draft minutes from October October fourth meeting. Does anybody on the commission have any questions or uh, comments about or corrections to note on the draft minutes for October fourth meeting? Raise your hand if you do, please. Okay, I don't see anything. Um, do I have a motion to approve our minutes from the October 4, 2021 meeting? This is Patrick, I move to approve the minutes. Do we have a second? I'll second, Trish. Okay. All right. All in favor of approving the minutes for October or October 4th, 2021 meeting, please say aye. 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 Those not aye. in favor? Oh, okay. <laughs> Those not in favor, please say no. Okay. The minutes have been approved unanimously. Give Tracy a minute to write that stuff down. <laughs> okay, I'm good. All right. Okay. Now we've come to our regular items. And the first thing is um, the introduction of our newest commission member, um, which is great. We I'm really, really glad because we, we went months and months and months with so many vacancies on the commission. So I'm just really, really happy that um, Sarah is joining us. And I want Sarah, please go ahead and introduce yourself. And um, you've got 15 minutes to tell us a little bit more about, about your background, your interest in open space and habitat and ag preservation and take it away. 
Thank you. I'm not sure I'll fill the whole 15 minutes, but um, I, I had a, a administrative question, I guess, because I am an, an alternate. Uh -huh. At what point do I actually vote or, or get involved? My understanding is that when we have a um, a commission member that's absent, like we have two commission members absent tonight, um, that you uh, can step in and, and vote at that time. Am I correct, Tracy? Yeah, yeah, I believe that's correct as well. Yeah. So if all of, we we are a commission of of seven, and if one of the six regular members is not at the meeting then you can then you can go ahead and vote or you know if more than one's not then you can go ahead and vote for sure okay thank you um i did have a some notes but i, I must have left it somewhere else in the house so i'm gonna <laughs> kind of wing it sorry but yeah so my name is sarah Gunsey. um i am currently in my fourth year as a graduate student in the soils and biogeochemistry graduate group at uc davis um, my lab studies soil viral ecology, so it's a lot of detailed stuff that most people don't really care about, um, but we look at viruses that infect my, uh, microbial communities to see how that impacts biogeochemical cycling, which is essentially carbon and nutrient cycling throughout the earth, um, seeing how they impact microbes and what are the virus host dynamics, and my project focuses on uh, the impact of fire on viruses. So I've been looking at prescribed burning and wildland fire and how that um, impacts microbial communities, but of course also keeping in mind the impact on soil and hydrology. And so this, it's a lot of uh, basic research and um, but at the same time I'm very interested in uh, and urban soils and um, want to move towards, move more towards uh, that type of research. Um, primarily looking at soil sealing, the impact of urban development on soil and uh, how that changes the capacity to, for soil to provide ecosystem services. Um, and of course, their capacity to grow food, um, urban soil, you know, how urban activity impacts um, soil formation um, and yeah, their capacity to provide various services. Uh, so that is my interest in that, you know, directly impacts obviously what we're talking about here as a commission um, in terms of land use, in terms of overdevelopment, where we decide to develop, or I guess, I don't know if I'm part of that, but where developers decide to develop. <laughs> And, um, and, you know, what is the optimal use of a certain land and who gets to decide that? Um, and I'll get more into this later, but my framework is definitely to, uh, to prioritize social justice and environmental justice and to look at, especially when we look at uh, developing land, um, a lot of there seems to be some kind of zero sum game. It's like, well, we need affordable housing, so we need to develop this land. And so we can't preserve this open space for habitat or restoration or whatnot. And it creates this dichotomy that I don't think is real. Um, and I think there's lots of other, lots of opportunities to be able to get both um, because that is what's important for human health ultimately. Um, so, yeah, so a lot of my how I think is um, in terms of social justice and environmental justice and racial justice and um, making sure that aligns with how we do land use policy and where we uh, recommend that spaces get developed or not. And um, anyways, to get it, I don't even know how much time this has been. Please cut me off. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, um Feel free to finish what you want to say, and then the, if there's time left over, I think it would be really good for the rest of the commission to introduce ourselves to you very briefly. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Great. Yeah, so I'll go briefly into like what I've actually done in my background. Like I have a bachelor's in environmental science. I got it at Auburn University. So I grew up in the South for most of my life, 
um, which I think provides an interesting perspective because I think the South has done a lot of interesting things in terms of conservation, um, but they're also very known for their sprawl and for their very, uh, I think, <laughs> inefficient use of land, highly inefficient use of land. Um, anyways, after that, I, I did two years of AmeriCorps in, um, in, in Oregon and worked with affordable housing nonprofits and worked in the electrification transportation sector. So I have some background in transportation uh, and I'm a avid uh, cyclist and a lot of my community engagement has been in uh, cycling and, and transportation, like access to active transportation, as well as uh, community gardening. So I think, you know, transportation and agriculture have been very important in my life. Um, so I've been highly involved in community gardens. I think they are a great use of land. Um, and it was ironically part of a farm it wasn't quite a community garden, but it was like a very small scale community focused farm that um, was in the heart of Portland, which is where I lived. And um, there's always this conversation is like, well, this land plot of land is so, you know, useful and uh, it should be changed to housing. Mm -hmm. I, I find this tension very interesting. Um, so I'm excited to hear more about all of this and be involved. And yeah, and then after that, I farmed for two years. So I have some experience in farming and small scale farming. And then I ended up here in grad school. Um, but yeah, like I said, again, a lot of my focus will be on and how I think about things. Uh, it will be focused on environmental justice and social justice. How do we address poverty and wealth inequality? And because it's so intricately tied to land use and uh, access to uh, a healthy environment, and that includes uh, open spaces. So not just like manicured parks, but areas where you can um, connect to nature, I guess is kind of a silly way to say it. But um, I think it's very good for human health and making sure that's accessible to everyone. Uh, and uh, making sure in the same way that it uh, isn't more accessible to wealthier people. Um, but I think that's a priority that I've read in the past, in your past uh, agendas. So I'm excited about that. Anyways, I think I'm done with my introduction. Okay. Well, let's go through the commission members and just take just take uh, 30 seconds or something to introduce yourself to Sarah and and I'll go last. So um, Lindsay, why don't you go next? Hi, Sarah, welcome. I'm Lindsay Korea. I, um, let's see, my background is really sort of working at the interface of science, planning, policy and management, mostly on California water and environmental issues centered on the Bay Delta. Um, my background is interdisciplinary and in sort of science and policy, and I guess in my day job, I focus on sort of climate resilience um, initiatives focused um, for the state, focused on California water management and ecosystem management. And I guess my interest in open space and habitat and the commission is really in being part of this local community and uh, having a young family that really enjoys, like, is everyone else frozen? Am I still talking? Okay, Patrick's frozen on my screen, so I'm not sure. Um, an interest in engaging in local community issues that uh, are of value to me and my family and sort of a, an opportunity to learn and be a part of um, the community in a way that sort of also builds on my. Uh, education and experiences. Cool, very cool. Um, Mark, you want to go next? Yeah. So my name is Mark, and uh, I also have a background in agriculture. In fact, I uh, got a PhD in agroecology from uh, UC Davis, 
Um, I spent my career working for the state, first for the Department of Water Resources, then for um, Air Resources Board on the Climate Change Program. I'm now retired and uh, I'm a long time resident of Davis and uh, I'm interested in the open space aspects um, going on around here. And I think uh, from what you told me, I think you should uh, be quite interested in the project that we're going to talk about a little later about that cannery urban farm because it was a land that was uh, paved and it was a cannery and now um, we're trying to turn it into an urban farm and it's not without uh, technical uh, trouble and uh, and uh, I think that's a very positive thing to do and uh, I hope you will be interested in that. Super, super, super. Tricia, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, Sarah. Welcome to the commission. Um, I recently transitioned from alternate, so I understand your sort of confusion about how that works. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Um, I am transitioning to retirement now from my from a research assistant position um, in the animal science department. My our research was focused on um, the environmental effects of dairy farming in the state of California. So not a lot of applications in Yolo County, but um, I'm interested in row cropping and sort of agricultural space preservation. Uh, that's my main focus. And also I am um, come from a bicycling background. Um, I was a bicycle advocate for many years and so um, I'm interested also in improving that sort of alternate transportation mode to our open spaces. Cool. Patrick? Hi, Sora. Uh, welcome to the commission. Uh, thanks for uh, agreeing to take the time and joining us and contributing to the city. Um, I guess I'm the longest uh, serving uh, commission member I've been on for 10 plus years. Um, like you, I'm at the university. Um, I got my PhD there a number of years ago in geography and never left. So I sit in the Department of Environmental Science and Policy and do a lot of uh, kind of comprehensive uh, conservation planning, uh, wildlife connectivity. Um, so my main uh, focus on the commission is uh, trying to help implement uh, ecological networks and uh, link up uh, different uh, fragmented pieces of the landscape and try to uh, kind of uh, reconnect uh, what we've lost over the past 150 years. Cool. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you, everybody. And um, again, I wanna reiterate what everybody said, Sarah, thank you so much and welcome to the commission. Thank you so much for being interested in joining us. We'll really, in benefit from having you as part of our group and discussions. It's wonderful. Um, I have been on the commission for, this is my third year. My first year as chair. I'm still getting used to running the meetings. Very different than anything I've ever done. Um, I'm also retired. I um, had a very long career in California doing um, conservation planning with the Nature Conservancy and also worked in the Department of Environmental Science and Policy at the Information Center for the Environment for several years, managing some projects related to river restoration and um, fire ecology, actually. Um, fire ecology and fire, the fire regimes of California vegetation. And then the last several years of my career, I um, um, was the executive director of our local watershed council. Um, here in, in California, which I got involved in as a graduate student at UC Davis, I have a master's in ecology from UC Davis. So we have a really great commission with a lot of extremely in, you know, talented people who have great experience and strong interests in what we're doing. So I'm really I'm thrilled. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, anybody else wanna, wanna say anything before we move on to the next item, or if you have any more questions, Sarah, feel free to chime in right now. I think I'm good. I'm very excited. I'm excited good. to be with you guys. 
Very good. Okay, let's move on to then to um, our regular item, uh, uh, our action item B, and this will we will take a vote on at the end of the discussion. So this will be your first vote, Sarah. You can, you will, uh, since we're missing both um, um, Emma and and also Romero, um, Ramiro, then we will um, take a vote at the end, and you you can um, vote as well. Um, so without further ado, I will turn this over to, to Tracy. What we're going to vote on tonight is we're going to look at the staff report and the recommendation from staff that the city council approve the selection of Fiery Ginger Farm to, as the new tenant farmer for the cannery farm, and then authorize the negotiation of a lease agreement, um, in concluding the cannery farms request for proposals process. So, um, we have about 45 minutes to 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 do this or a little bit more if we need it and uh tracy i'll kick it off to you okay thank you carrie um denise can i share my screen yeah tracy you should be able to share it can i share it now okay yeah. Hey, Ira, I, Ira, I see your hands up, which is great. And we, we will um, op open this up for public comment um, after, the, after the presentation and the commission has a chance for questions. So go ahead and leave your hand up, but I just wanna let you know I see you. Now, does everybody see the full um, screen or do you see it in presentation mode? Mm. Presentation mode. Yeah. Presentation mode. Okay, let me try this. How about that? You can see the whole thing now? Okay. Um, so um, anyway, I, I, I will just briefly kind of summarize the staff report. I'm not gonna go into everything that was in the staff report, but hopefully everybody um, read it and um, I want to leave enough time at the end for discussion and questions if anybody has any questions. Um, and then also um, Mark um, Vassiers is here as well. He was on the working group and also on the selection panel, as was Emma. And she, um, and she um, is not here tonight, but she did um, send in something, a little email to me that I can read later. Um, so that everybody kind of gets a feel for her, her views on this as well. But I thought I'd just um, quickly summarize the staff report. Um, and so as Carrie already mentioned, you know, uh, what we're asking, what staff is asking for tonight is just approval of the selection of Fiery Ginger Farm. Um, and basically choosing them to be the entity that we will then kind of work towards a lease with. And then I'll be coming back to the commission uh, quickly, hopefully in December, December 1st, so your next meeting, I would be coming back with um, uh, asking for a recommendation to the city council to approve the lease. So it's two different actions. One tonight is just the selection. And then, um, in December, it'll be the actual lease. So just to just quickly refresh everybody's memory, we, you know, we did this request for proposals. It was released back in June. Um, it was kind of the result of a public outreach process that began, you know, basically a year previously. Um, there we did informational mailing to everybody in the cannery. We did two different surveys asking um, all the residents and owners that live in the cannery about their preferred uses for the farm. Um, as you know, we had several public commission meetings where people could um, speak. And we had three meetings of the cannery farm working group, which was comprised of um, three city staff and two members of this commission, one member of the rec and park commission, and then I think nine cannery farm um, residents. And then also the commission reviewed the draft RFP and the city council approved it um, at the um, June 22nd meeting. 
we advertised it widely, widely. I sent it to, I think, 37 individual farmers and uh, entities and both farm bureaus and both ag commissioners and the Cape Hay Valley uh, farm farmer organization and the Davis Farmers Market. We tried to, you know, advertise it as far and wide as possible. And the Smittles were due on September 24th. And we, we had several people and several entities inquire and ask questions um, and come to the site visit. But at the end of the day, we only received one proposal by the deadline. Um, and that proposal was from Fiery Ginger Farm. And um, I'll, I'll tell you about the evaluation process in a second, but I'll just briefly tell you a little bit about them. Um, more, there's obviously more information in the staff report, but they're um, a, a six-year-old uh, farm, farming business. It's owned and run by Hope Sapola and Shane. Zerilgen, I don't know if I pronounced that right. Um, I always call them Hope and Shane. Um, and they specialize in um, basically they uh, are they ag they they grow and aggregate um, produce and meats from several different farms, including theirs in West Sacramento, and several different farms in the area. They aggregate the produce together and then they sell them to sell the produce to schools um, in particular and restaurants, farmers markets, grocery stores, and they also have a, CS, a CSA box um, business that they currently operate. Um, in their proposal, um, if you saw it, it was attached to the staff report. Um, we asked, we in the RFP, we asked for, um, we asked the, um, submitters to say what, what would be their three top goals for the site in the, during the first three years. And so um, Fire Your Ginger um, said that, you know, the first one was really to remediate the soil further. Um, as you know, we've, we, there have been uh, efforts to remediate it already. Um, uh, the soil was replaced several years ago. Um, then, you know, the Center for Land-Based Learning, who was the previous tenant, got a Healthy Soils grant. They um, used, you know, um, used that for a couple of years on, you know, basically growing various cover crops and trying to increase the nutrients in the soil. And it did improve, but um, not enough. And so they are going to really focus on um, doing further remediation um, for the soil. And I think in the um, staff report and in the proposal, it gave a lot of detail about how they plan to do that. You know, it's kind of a combination of uh, various cover crops growing uh, vegetables that are um, more tolerant of boron, which is kind of the main problem out there. There's boron in the soil and boron in the ag well water. Um, and tr really trying to increase the, um, the um, porousness or the, 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 the drainage of the dirt because that, that was a big problem, but it didn't drain well and the boron would build up in the soil. So their plan is to really kind of slowly remediate and, but also at the same time, in, you know, slowly, gradually over time, transition the production field to um, vegetable production. And they are also focusing on kind of really building a community where the farm is supported and the residents view it as an asset. They really stress that in their interview. Um, they're partnering with um, the existing licensees that are out there. Uh, they, they really want, um, and that they, you know, they're, they, they have a lot of, um, desire to have a very robust community engagement plan. So they, they really want the community involved, um, in the farm. And, um, they think, you know, not only will that be good for the community, but it'll also be good for the farm because it will help with, um, maintenance and also just maybe um, decreasing theft issues. 
Um, and then third, they, they really um, are excited about their Spork Farm to School Food Hub uh, program that they have started. Um, you may remember that they currently are a licensee out there at the Cannery Farm. They basically just have a license to use the giant cooler that is inside the barn for this program. So they, they currently do, you, they have rights to use about half of the cooler right now um, to um, basically they deliver uh, food to the cooler and then they distribute it to various school districts in the area, including the Davis um, School District. And, but they really would like to um, expand that program and also give it a home because it really doesn't have one. And so that, that was um, one of their big goals too, is to um, kind of use the cannery farm as the hub for this uh, farm to school food hub, hub program. As I mentioned, you know, in their proposal, they partnered with um, several entities. Um, the, the three uh, current licensees out there, well, there's four, including them, but the other three are Leaf and Lark Farm, which um, does some farming in the greenhouse and the orchard area, and the Bee Charmers, who has a bee, ha has hives and also like a um, does a lot of um, workshops and um, different events related to um, beekeeping um, at the cannery. And then the bike campaign, which is in the tractor shed. And they have um, bike maintenance and repair. So they, the, they were part of this proposal. And they're, so they would stay on and basically um, they would transition from being uh, licensees of the city to subtenants of Fire Ginger Farm. And then in addition to that, they also are partnering with um, Sola Bee Farms, uh, which is another um, big honey producer in the area and a beekeeper. And then also, um, oh, I don't have it on here, but I guess, cause I said it earlier, or, or I thought I did, maybe I'm going to say it next, the Davis Farmer's Market, they're also partnering with them to try to have kind of a, a, a satellite um, farmer's market at the cannery um, and also have kind of uh, use the, um, use some of the resources from the Davis farmer's market to have some educational uh, events at the cannery, like some cooking classes and things like that. So um, Hope and Shane, they're both, uh, they were former subtenants at front of CLBLs when CLBL was the tenant out there. So they, um, that was one of the um, things that they played up about their experience was that they really know the land because they were already out there. They know what the problems were. Um, and they're also both graduates of CLBL's California Farm Academy. Um, yeah, did I skip a, no, I guess I did not. I don't know. I thought I lost, sorry about that. I would have sworn there was another slide. Um, anyway, again, just to briefly summarize, you know, again, in the RFP, we asked them for an operational plan, a community engagement plan, and a business and marketing plan. And um, so there's a lot of detail about it in their proposal and in the staff report, but just, you know, high level summary is, you know, again, for the operational plan, they're going to really focus on trying to uh, use regenerative organic farming practices to improve the soil conditions over time and slow with the goal of, you know, slowly, slowly transitioning more and more acreage over time to um, vegetable production as the soil gets better over time. Um, and the boron can be uh, managed better. Um, they are committed to organic farming. In, in the RFP, we didn't re require um, organic certification, but we did require organic practices. And so they are committed to that. Um, so um, that the, so the, um, the production field would, that, that's kind of the focus of the production field over time. And then the rest of the farm 
um, the rest of their operations, I guess, would be running this, uh, this food hub and, um, you know, also working with their subtenants to have these various community engagement events, because that is one way not only to engage the community, but also they see them, uh, the events is also kind of expanding their market share and trying again with the goal of trying to, uh, del you know, not, not only help them, but like I said, they aggregate uh, produce from a lot of other farms. And so it's helping other farms as well, find new markets for their product. And just, and then they kind of act as the um, distributor to these various um, um, end users like the schools and restaurants. Um, their community engagement plan, uh, you know, they're going to, they're going to do things themselves, but they're also going to be uh, relying on their partners to do um, some of these things as well. Um, Leaf and Lark Farm and the Beach Armors and um, Davis Farmers Market. But, you know, they, they really have, they've done all of these things before at their other farm. Both of them are former um, educators. And they, so they have um, a background and history of um, you know, teaching and being engaged. And so that, that is something that they are comfortable with. Um, they're, they really, like I said, want to get the community involved. They already have um, connections with Davis, the Davis High School Agricultural Program. And they really wanna get some of those students out there to help with um, the, um, the analysis of the boron in the soil, in the production field. So they, they really had a lot of um, cool ideas about how to engage uh, the community. Um, and I think on the business and marketing plan, I think I've I already kind of touched on it. It's this concept of that, the aggregating and also trying to really, again, over time, get, you know, in, through the engagement, it's building community, but also getting the word out and trying to, you know, expand um, their customer base and, um, you know, uh, expand their market share. And, you know, hopefully their goal is to, you know, get more aggregate of uh, Increase, I think it's 10 farms right now that they, that they aggregate the produce farm, the produce from, and they would like to, you know, expand that. And then slowly as, as the cannery farm itself heals, they could, you know, add in the produce that's grown uh, right then, uh, right there on the production field. So we had a, an evaluation process. We had a selection panel, which was two city staff people and two members of this commission, um, which was um, Commissioner Vassiers and Torbert. And then we had um, two cannery residents. They were, um, they volunteered from the cannery working group. Um, we all met, just the selection panel met on October 14th. We discussed the proposal, um, the written proposal and, um, uh, we evaluated the proposal based on the selection criteria in the RFP. And at that meeting, we decided, you know, we did have some follow-up questions that we wanted to ask for our ginger farm. So we um, decided on an interview. So we all got together and interviewed them on the 21st of October. And then everybody submitted their scores. Um, and the average of the six was, 97 out of 105. I think everybody on the panel was um, very um, impressed with their proposal and the interview. And we felt like they did a good job of answering our questions and had, you know, also were, uh, you know, had a practical vision and they felt like they, or we, the selection panel felt like they, um, you know, because of their past experience, they really knew what they were getting into and had kind of learned from their past challenges and had adjusted what they were going to do out there based on, you know, their past experience there. And, um, and also just 
uh, everybody really liked the connection with the schools and trying to distribute, aggregating produce from multiple farms and distributing them to schools. So, you know, at the end of that process, the selection panel recommended that they be selected and um, that we, you know, move on to the next stage of the process, which would be the lease. Um, so if the commission um, agrees, uh, you know, I was planning to go to the city council on the 16th. It would be just a consent item um, to do, what, do what, similar to what we're doing tonight, which is approving the selection and then come back to this commission on December 1st for the lease and then back to the city council on the 21st to approve the lease. And like I mentioned, the current licenses out there with Leaf and Lark and the Beach Armors and the bike campaign, um, they expire anyway at the end of the year unless I extended them. And so they would basically be terminated, but they would be folded into the new lease as um, subtenants. So that's how we would um, get them back um, uh, get them under contract in a different way. So um, that is basically the summary. So um, that kind of concludes my presentation. I don't know if anybody has any other uh, questions about the staff report or about the proposal or the process or anything, but I'm happy to answer them. And um, I would ask that, yes, you take a vote um, tonight on um, the recommendation. Okay, great, Tracy. Thank you very much. That was really that was really really good summary of what was in the staff report and the proposal. Um, so what we'll do first is take any um, just clarifying questions from members of the commission. If there was something about the presentation or something in the in the staff report and attachments that you have a question about and need some clarifying information. Now's the time to ask Tracy. Um, we won't discuss we won't discuss this yet until um, we've opened it up for members of the public to also ask questions and make comments. So um, if anybody on the commission has a question um, for Tracy, um, now's the time to do it. Go ahead and raise your hand, and then when we're done asking um, asking questions, I'll open it up to the uh, members of the public who are here that would like to comment and um, ask questions. Um, um, Tricia, go ahead. Thanks, Carrie. Thank you, Tracy. That was a good summary. I agree with Carrie on that. Um, I do, uh, I wonder if the, I know this is kind of different from the other leases that you manage and I wonder, but I wonder if the text of those leases is available to the public. If we could just kind of look at that to sort of help us decide about the lease the text of the other leases? Yeah. Um, well, I guess, so the, the, this is kind of a unique site. So I'm not sure yeah. how useful the other leases would be, but the lease that I basically, the lease that I would be using would, is, I've already kind of started it, is, is, um, is based on the lease that we had there previously with the Center for Land-Based Learning. Okay. Um, and so it's it's kind of it's kind of our standard agricultural lease, but it's but it's majorly tailored to the cannery farm, which is kind of a unique thing. Yeah. Um, so I'm kind of using that, and then um, uh, now tailoring it to Fiery Ginger Farm. Okay. So, but it's not majorly different from the other standard ag leases. No. No. Okay. No. okay. Sarah, you have a question? Yeah, I have a few, and I'm sorry if it's redundant, um, but um, just a question on who actually will, what other farms are actually gonna be part of this aggregate? Um, where are they and is that part of the report or is it kind of a more ambiguous, like other farms will be involved. Just curious as to who else will benefit from this business interaction. So that's a good question. I uh, they definitely work with ten farms, but the, during the interview, we they they didn't tell us exactly which ones though they those were. 
I mean, I'm sure they could tell us which 10 they were, but um, they're, in, they're in this general area. They're probably not all in Yolo County, but you know, they, um, Fire Ginger is based in West Sacramento. And so it's kind of, they have to be within that driving distance. So I don't know the names of all 10, but I'm sure I could probably get that information. I'm sure they would be happy to share it. It just didn't come up. It wasn't in their proposal and it didn't come up during the interview. Yeah, and I also wonder like, is it stuck to these 10 or are there opportunities for others to join in? Oh yeah, no, it's definitely not stuck to this mm -hmm. the, the 10. I mean, that, that's what they want to, they want to expand. And that's the whole point of trying to you know, locate this food hub and, you know, give it a home and, you know, you know, do the more marketing and, you know, that they, they want to expand and do have more farms. So it's definitely not just set in stone that it has to just be these 10. Cool. My other uh, comment is just the affordability of the CSA. So I know a lot of this is, is like school-based stuff, but I know that individual, um, consumers as part of the proposal. So I'm just curious as to who, like, what's the audience of the CSA? Um, and, and then the kind of related is maybe because I don't very much know about the cannery and all the specifics, but how much is this a working relationship between the farm and the residents of the cannery versus the broader community? Um, so with all the, so it's, it's city property. So it's definitely going to be, um, open to, um, it, it's definitely going to be open, uh, to anybody, you know, in terms of like the, when I say open to anybody, it, when they have events or they have you pick opportunities or the CSA boxes or, you know, classes or whatever, it would be open to everybody um, and would be, you know, advertised to everybody. So um, it's, it's not going to just be for the cannery um, farm or the cannery residents. Um, in terms of the CSA, I know they have like a hundred people that are currently in their CSA, but we didn't get into what their pricing was or anything like that. But again, they want that their whole, one of their things was they uh, wanted to um, uh, expand. I think they said their CSA audience kind of fluctuates between 60 and hundred and they definitely wanted to um, expand that. Um, so, um, I, but I, again, don't know the demographics of that or, who, you know, who the hundred people are or where they live or anything like that. I don't know the demographics of that, but I just to say that they are really interested in expanding that and making it broader and bigger and, um, you know, uh, along with, you know, more farms. I mean, they've basically built up what they have today in a couple of years. And so they, you know, are really now looking to use the cannery as sort of a launching pad to make it bigger. Any other um, questions from commission members before I, before we move on to public comment and public questions? Okay. Um, so just that I would be interested in hearing Emma's uh, or comments whenever that's appropriate. That would be, let's wait until after the public's yeah. had a chance um, because they're not questions so much, they're comments. Um, and let's, let's, um, let's give Vern and then Ira, if Ira also wants to comment still. And I apologize, I didn't, I didn't um, give time for public comment on, um, on Sarah's um, appointment to the commission, which I'm not sure whether Ira wanted to comment on that or not. But if you if you if you want to go back and say anything um, to Sarah, welcoming her to the commission or anything about her coming onto the commission, you're welcome to do that. 
Ira, I, I didn't mean to cut you off, but um, Vern, go ahead. If you have some um, comments or questions about the proposal, feel free right now. Um, try to keep it as short as you can, but, but there's only two of you, so five minutes is fine. And Vern Gehring, go ahead. I think Tracy, you might have to give him uh, permission to talk because I don't see. Um, is Denise there? Let's see. I don't see Denise on anymore. Oh, really? Nope. Uh-oh. <laughs> Let me see if I can figure it out. Okay, Vern, can you hear me? Uh, yes, but I was asking, suggesting if Ira could go first, I would rather have him speak first. Okay. okay. All right, Ira, I'm gonna allow you to talk. Go ahead. Okay, can you hear me now? We yes. can. Yay. Um, I've, I've already forgotten her name. I'm so sorry. We Sarah. fully support Sarah. We fully support Sarah's uh, 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 alternate uh, position. She sounds wonderf wonderfully qualified. Uh, I will be very brief because uh, we're, uh, I'm a member of the Urban Farm Committee here at the Cannery. I'm a Cannery resident. The Urban Farm Committee is a very small group of people two of who were on the uh, um, selection panel. Um, so we are a committee of the home, uh, Cannery Homeowner uh, Owners Association Board of Directors, and Vern is on the Board of Directors. Um, I thought the um, plans were very detailed, uh, seemed to cover all the bases. Uh, I think it's a good proposal. Uh, really looking forward to this becoming a reality. As you know, um, things kind of went south with the uh, Center for Land-Based Learning and there was uh, a wide disappointment uh, in the community because of the promise for the farm to fork concept. So we're excited that it looks like something may come to fruition and that it's a good plan. Uh, so I, and I believe all the member on our committee are in, are in full support. Uh, I did have one uh, suggestion and maybe it's more of a question um, as you as you read um, the condition of the soil is sort of a real pivot point uh, in a number of uh, uh, ways of looking at the uh, uh, the farm um, my suggestion is uh, that the uh, I, I noticed it, it appeared from the budget there will be one soil analysis each year um, and my suggestion is that the full soil analysis report, not just the interpretation, but the full report uh, be made available to the city, uh, to cannery residents, to anyone who's interested. I think that would go a long way to sort of building trust uh, with the fiery ginger farm and, and the residents, because I think uh, there was some mistrust uh, on that issue uh, with the Center for Land-Based Learning. So that's my sort of one suggestion, is just to be very open about that soil analysis, let everybody chime in on that. Uh, so nobody feels like anything's being hidden or uh, misinterpreted. Uh, other than that, uh, there's the, the uh, <laughs> very long uh, uh, proposal, uh, but everything I read uh, looks good to me. So that's that's all I'd like to say, thank you. Okay. Okay. Vern, would you like to speak now? Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? We can. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, I'm Vern Gehring, and I'm a member of the Cannery Association Board, and I've served as the liaison between the board and the Cannery Urban Farm Committee that we created about a year ago to help represent the community in this effort. I just wanted to take a minute to thank the city and the commission very much for including the Canada community in this deliberation process, not only indirectly through listening sessions and surveys, but directly in terms of allowing 
the Canada Urban Farm Committee to sit and meet and talk and, and visit and work collaboratively on an ongoing active basis with the commission and the city. We've learned a lot in the last year or so about the challenges of the past of this farmland. And we recognize that there are lots of challenges remaining. Uh, but we're excited about going forward in a very collaborative relationship, hopefully with the city and the commission, commission and identifying you know, continuing problems, resolving those, working with uh, the city, working with Fire and Ginger Farm, you will discover if you have an array that there's just lots of community excitement about th this project and going forward and trying to get this back on, back in gear and back on the road. And just personally, I wanna share, I'm excited about this uh, selection of this farm, this proposal with Fire and Ginger Farm because I just learned a couple of days ago that my daughter who is an art teacher at Harper Middle School has been a longtime friend and fan of Hope Sapola. So mm -hmm. that doubly confirms to me that this is a wise choice. Thank you very much. Very cool. Okay, thank you so much Vern and thank you Ira for your, for your support and your comments. Um, now I'd like to open it up to the commit commission um, for discussion about this action item, both discussion and then um, for motions to be put forward. But I think first, and I agree with Lindsay, I think it would be really good to start off possibly with Emma's comments that, that she emailed to Tracy and we could read those and then continue with questions and discussion. And then um, when, when uh, members of the commission feel it's appropriate, um, putting forward motion putting forward motions. So Tracy, okay. would, you, would you read um, Emma's email to us? Yeah, sure. It's short. Okay. Um, she says, I support the selection of Fire Ginger Farms as the new tenant for the cannery farm. While they were the only candidate, their proposal was very strong and met or exceeded the requirements of creating a community oriented, environmentally focused farm at this location. I am glad that the city is prepared to work with the tenants to make sure the irrigation water is suitable for the crops grown going forward, as that will be essential for the farm's success. That's what she wrote. Because yeah, we, we did mention that, um, you know, the city was, uh, was, um, willing to look at possibly um, flushing out the ag well occasionally with the potable water. So, you know, to, to kind of dilute the boron, but we weren't able to do that um, because of the drought. We, we, we would be willing to reconsider that if we get into a little bit better water situation, but we didn't want to just do that, use the potable for that when we were in the drought. But that is definitely something that, that the city would consider doing. So I think that's why she mentioned that um, the issue of the city being willing to look at possible solutions to helping with the boron in the ag well water. Vern, do you have another question or comment or um, you just didn't take your hand your hand down? I didn't take my hand down, sorry. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right. Um, are there any other members of the commission that would like to ask more questions or you know, make comments about the, about the proposal or make a motion? I do. Okay, Mark. Well, I was also part of the selection process and uh, Personally, I'm quite happy to have this uh, proposal. Um, I think those, uh, you know, um, Tracy has uh, well um, summarized, uh, you know, the, the proposal, but what I retain is that first, uh, it seems to me that uh, it's positive that they know the place and I kn they know all the difficulties. So they, they go in there, their eyes open. Um, second, there, there actually are urban farmers already because the land they're farming is uh, kind of in the middle of uh, West Sacramento. And so they have that experience. And I think it's very, 
different to be a farmer uh, somewhere out in the countryside and take your pickup truck every so often to go to the market or deliver your boxes and to really be there um, you know close to the people so i think they have that experience they also they have a background as educators so they they have that um you know uh, ability to interact with people and with young people um i was really um uh happy to see that they were uh ready to work with the other subtenants there because um i think that um you know really for what we're looking at having a variety of uh different um uh, people there is only in going to increase the richness of the interaction and the possibilities of learning more about you know agriculture and producing food and uh, finally, uh, I'm, I like their, um, that they have uh, that main business being to aggregate produce of others because they're not like, um, you know, in my mind, they're not like a big producer already that's just looking for, um, you know, uh, more distribution for the production. They're, they're actually uh, working with uh, many other uh, producers out there and with the school. So I, I thought all those points were, were very positive in my mind. And I wish them, uh, you know, a lot of luck and, uh, and good, uh, good work. You should go ahead. Thanks, Harry. Um, I, I, I agree with Mark on, on all of that. I think um, it's a, you know, they're really strong candidates. I don't have any objection to um, sort of recommending uh, selection. Um, the one thing I kind of have, I concerns about, I guess, is that, you know, this increased richness of interaction that Mark mentioned could uh, lead to potentially increased demands on um, program times, uh, time and commitment. And so I just wonder if it would be a good idea to kind of watch that over the next year or so and make sure since this isn't Measure O property that the program gets the resources it needs to deal with this property. You mean the open space program? Yes. Mm -hmm. your time and whatever other yeah and uh -huh. you know just kind of keep an eye on that so that it doesn't become a drain on the program mm -hmm. well that's a good question tracy what what do you feel like your time commitment is going to be after you draw up the the lease the lease agreements <laughs> well um that's kind of hard to, to know. I mean, um, you know, if the, the, the hope is, I mean, the, 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 I think the city's desire always from the very beginning was to try to get a good operator out there mm -hmm. so that, um, you know, that that would minimize, you know, what the city has to do out there. I mean, we're still going to have, we still have responsibilities out there, for example, um, you know, when, when the Center for Land-Based Learning was out there, we, we, we also gave them, <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't really have time for this, but it was in the lease that they were supposed to take care of the, the hedgerow on the, the uh, eastern side of the farm. And that was just too much. And so um, I, you know, midway through, you know, the open space program kind of said, no, we will take over that. Um, because, you know, they had enough on their hands just dealing with the farm. So the open space program will be, um, we have been taking responsibility for that hedgerow and, you know, it does need some work. Like we need to do some new plantings and actually that's something that the community, uh, the cannery anyway, has expressed a desire for is that in particular, that that hedgerow perhaps, um, you know, gets planted more with some um, some Patwin 
some some kind of native plants that maybe the Patwin used for either medicinal purposes or for cultural purposes and, you know, maybe have some signage out there and try to, you know, make it kind of a, a more interactive educational area. So that's something, you know, that, you know, is on my list that maybe we could work on. So we're, we are going to have some obligations out there, but I'm hoping that, you know, between fiery ginger and leaf and lark and you know um I, i'm happy actually uh, that there will be multiple entities out there because i think you know the problems that i've had you know over t you know since clbl has left have mostly had to do with you know vandalism and problems of theft and break-ins and things like that and so that i'm hoping that and that actually isn't even that's more my property management hat but I'm hoping that now that there'll be more of a regular presence out there, that that actually will be decreased. So I appreciate Patricia what you're saying, and I'm, I'm believe me, I'm definitely going to be <laughs> watching that myself because I I also don't want um, the property to be a drain on uh, the open space budget for sure, and and also on my time because there's there's only so much of it, and um, you know hopefully. Um, you know, we'll have a good, we'll have a good collaborative working relationship and, um, you know, we'll, you know, as they get out there and start, you know, um, you know, getting a handle on their operations, you know, my, my time will go further, you know, be reduced. That also begs, to, um, I know that the, the buildings and the facilities out there were supposed to be managed cooperatively cooperatively with the um with the uh parks department you know city's parks department will they be working with fiery ginger um on stuff related to the facilities the buildings and events will they and so that you don't have to get involved in that whole aspect of it i hope um well so parks parks is really only involved with the farm house um, they're going to be programming. So this, the what Fire Ginger uh, Fire Ginger won't have the house. Fire Ginger will have the barn and the tractor shed, um, but not the house. The house is is um, is kind of part of the city's um, you know facilities rental stock. You know, like Vets Memorial. Yeah. So and that Parks manages that. So Parks will be. Um, Parks will still be involved in that capacity, but they're not going to be helping at all with any of the farm events. Okay. Okay. Lindsay, I see your hands up. Yeah. Thank. Thank you. That this all sounds really great. It's great to hear the positive feedback from the commissioners who participated in the process and the selection activity. I think. Um, I guess a couple of questions one would the elements about sort of the time and the hedgerow would that all be part of the lease agreement tracy that we would sort of discuss in the next stage here and then my other question is about um the public comment we received about the soil condition report um where would that be addressed or that recommendation be sort of considered in this process? Yeah, those are good questions. So on the, the hedgerow, yeah, the, the, the um, maintenance responsibilities, who's doing what will be outlined in the lease. And so um, I've already kind of said in the lease that, you know, that the city will be responsible for maintaining the Eastern hedgerow. So they're not going to be responsible for that. So that, that would be all spelled out in the lease so everybody's clear about who's supposed to be doing what who's supposed to be maintaining what even the hoa has a little piece of the farm believe it or not um there there's, there's a little bit of the the landscaping that even the hoa takes care of and so that's also in the lease um and then on the soils um you know i that that's definitely i i think that's a great idea and you know i that's something i can put in the lease too where they um are required to share that with the city and you know i would 
you know, um, either they can share it directly with the HOA or I can, um, but we can definitely work out some kind of mechanism to make sure um, those who are interested have um, copies of the soils reports. Thank you. Any other, so that, Oops, sorry, go oh, ahead, Lindsay. Oh, so just that wouldn't need to be any part of any motion to approve the recommendation. No, you Those probably elements. could, when it comes back, you could, you know, when it comes back, you can look in the lease, you know, when, when that item comes before you next time, you can look at the lease and see what the wording says. Thank you. Okay. Last call for, for questions or comments about the, um, about the, the proposal and the staff reports. Well, or if there, if there are none, uh, then... the, this is Patrick, just oh, uh, Patrick. really quick. Um, I support what I've heard here. I think that this sounds like a good option. And I just want to thank everyone that's put in the time and effort to get us to this stage and what seems like um, is going to be uh, a good uh, step forward and hopefully uh, getting something positive uh, out of the site. So thank you, everyone. Very cool. Well, if nobody else wants to step forward, I will make a motion. And I, I um, make a motion to recommend that the city council approve Fiery Ginger Farm as the new tenant farmer for the cannery farm and authorize um, Tracy to negotiate a lease agreement. I second. Okay, let's do a vote, roll call vote. All in favor say say yes. If you're not in favor, are, please. All are we favor. doing a roll call roll or call. just everyone? Yeah, we should probably do one by one. Roll call. Oh, sorry. Yeah, one by one. Just to ro I'll go through everybody's names. Roll call vote. And then um, if, you, if you're in favor, please say yes. If not, please say no. Um, Lindsay? Yes. Patrick? Aye. Okay. Trisha Price, Trisha? Yes. Um, I vote in favor also, yes. Uh, Mark Bassier? Yes. And Sarah? Yes. Did you call Lindsay? Did I? I thought I did. Did I? Yes, you did. Okay. Yes, you did. Thank okay. you. Great. All right. So we have we have that. Thank you so much, um, Ira and Vern, for participating tonight and giving us your giving us your input on the on the whole process and and also your support. Appreciate it a lot. A lot, a lot, a lot. Thanks for serving on the committees as well. I got this through. Okay, let's move on to the last item tonight, and that's um, a presentation, a discussion item, and presentation from Tracy about our the program's 2021 annual financial review. And um, we'll take it away. Okay, and um, Denise, am, am I able to share again? I hope I don't cut her off again. <laughs> yeah, no, you should be able to share, Tracy. Okay. Did you cut her off last time by accident? Well, I, I, I may have. <laughs> She's back on now. I don't know what I did. No, all is good, Tracy. Thank you. Okay. And does it look full screen now? Mm hmm okay so i'll um i'll try to get through this i'll try to just be as brief as possible um it's a high level high level summary here um, try to go through it quick but um i know there are a lot of new commissioners on this commission that um haven't um 
gone through one of these financial reviews before. And so um, also say, you know, if you also have questions after the meeting, you know, later and you wanna just email me questions, you know, I'm always available by email. But normally we do this financial review in June, but this year um, just the budget wasn't ready in time and I didn't have the information. So that's why we're doing it now. Um, so just quick, the overview of the presentation, I'm just gonna briefly talk about um, the year that has passed, the 2020-2021 fiscal year. Um, just some of the quick accomplishments. I'm not going to go through them all because there are a lot. Um, and the but and then just kind of look at the budget versus um, what we actually spent. And then looking forward for this upcoming fiscal year, we'll kind of just talk about what the budget principles are, look at the revenues and expenses, and also the goals for the coming year. Uh, we'll also review the fund balances. I'll, explain what those are, but we have three of them that relate to the open space program. And then um, we also, at the end, look at the uh, Measure O spreadsheet to look at the Measure O um, fund, because that one's the most important. So the past year, again, one of the reasons I put this detail up, I know there's a lot of text on the slide, so I'm not gonna talk about it all. But I, I, this is one of the documents that I publish on the city's website. So actually, I already put it up because um, you know we're already into November, and so I wanted to get it up there on the website so that anybody can look at it and get sort of a feel for the budget um, and also just what you know what we've been working on and what we are going to work on the next year. These are all. Um, all of these are the ones that we, um, or that, I, that, yeah, that we, we talked about when we had our joint meeting with the city council um, earlier this year, and we um, kind of talked with them about what our major accomplishments were, and also these were in the budget document itself. Um, so there, nothing new. It's the same things that we've talked about. The the various, and they're organized by the. Um, subject area, this, the, the um, subject areas of the strategic plan. So, you know, in acquisitions, we had the, the easements that we, um, the new conservation easements that we closed on. And for habitat restoration, we had, you know, the North Davis uplands, um, the land and resource management, we had the wild horse management plan we finally finished. And that's also posted on the city's website. Um, we, for the program and financial accountability, we, we like I said, um, are continually updating and posting all those programmatic documents that weren't on the website before. Um, for public access and recreation, we had South Fork Preserve. Um, and then for public engagement and partnerships, we've really, really expanded our network of organizations that we're working with on a continual basis to, um, you know, kind of, um, expand our labor pool of bodies that we need to help take care of the open space um, lands. So, you know, you can look at all of these at your leisure. I won't go through them in a lot of detail. And like I said, we kind of already, I know some of the, maybe some of the newer commissioners, um, it's been a while because I think we had our meeting with the city council back in March, but um, you know, that this is kind of what we went over with them in March. So then on the budget itself, um, so to give everybody sort of an idea, the, the, the baseline, I think of it as the baseline budget. And then every year we request additions to the baseline. Um, but the baseline budget basically is about $440,000. That's the minimum kind of that I need to do the regular operations and maintenance for the open space properties. And you'll see later, we have multiple funding sources for that. Um, amount, but that's kind of, you know, to sort of maintain the status quo, that's kind of what we need. Um, and then every year, you know, there's an opportunity for me to request some additional funds. Usually they're just one-time funds, you know, um, short-term projects or one-time things, not 
not additional ongoing um, obligations, but you know, like an acquisition or a special maintenance project, like for example, you know, uh, removing invasive species in a particular area or something like that, or a capital improvement project. Um, so here are the um, the, the uh, revenues, the budget versus actuals. You'll see. Um, that you know it's not 100% and that's partly because you know <laughs> covid affected everything and you know we 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 didn't use as much money as we thought in terms of you know because we really had to scale back our we had a lot of large larger volunteer events scheduled um, on the north davis upland project and we we didn't do a lot of those because of um, the pandemic so um, you can see that we, um, you know, were didn't spend as much measure as we had budgeted, um, and but every, everything else we pretty much spent. But you can see that um, uh, oh yeah, so right, seventy five percent. I was looking at the wrong number. We really only spent seventy five percent of what we thought we were going to spend. Um, and so this kind of shows you the various revenue sources. So you can see we get a little bit of ag lease revenue, not a lot. We get a little bit from the Mace 25. We get a little bit from some of our other ag lands, but um, but not a lot. We even get some. We get some park maintenance fees, and the reason we we get some of those is because um, you know, like some of our property, some of the open space areas that we maintain like the Poudre Creek Parkway, um, you know, they are open space, but they still in some ways function as kind of like a green belt. And so we, we get a little bit of park maintenance fees to help with the Poudre Creek Parkway. Um, we get some funding sources from open space. We get some money from open space development impact fees. Those usually, um, help only with um, capital improvements. Those don't help with like ongoing maintenance, um, but they are in the budget because they are helping to fund some of our capital improvements. And then of course we have general fund, which is a biggie. Um, and then we have measure O. So the, the, you can see, um, you know, the bigger um, sources are the general fund and measure O. And then in terms of how that, how that money is spent, um, well, it's easier for, let me just skip, oh no, I guess I didn't do a little chart. How that money is spent um, is, you know, a lot of that goes towards uh, personnel and personnel, I'll, I'll, later in the presentation, I'll show you who that is, which is, it's basically myself, a little bit of my salary and Chris, a little bit of Chris's salary. And then we have a temporary part-time person, but that also includes some of the contractors that we use to help with um, some of the maintenance. Like we have a mow, you know, we have Chris needs help with mowing in the spring. And, you know, sometimes he'll, he'll hire um, um, a company to help with um, some pruning or treat an arborist and things like that. So personnel includes that. That's not just um, city staff. Um, or, oh, I guess it is. The non-personnel is the, con the contracted property management service. I guess the personnel is just city staff. So, um, so then on the non-personnel, we have the contracted property management services, which includes what I just mentioned. And then we have a little bit of overhead and then the capital improvements. So it's, it's not super complicated. And that, that those are basically the categories that are in, um, you know, the um, program 3255, which is basically everything other than Measure O, and then 3256, which is Measure O. So you can kind of see how how that how those funds uh, were these are the actuals how they were actually spent um so this fiscal year you know we had the same kind of principles that we're trying to stick stick with since we um started this 
um, you know, analysis back in 2015. Um, and the, one of the kind of main principles is uh, to keep maintenance expenses um, at 33% of the whole parcel tax that comes in. Um, so the, the parcel tax generates about 670,000 a year. And, you know, we, we um, pledged back in 2015 that we would um, not use more than a third of that for paying for maintenance. And that means like staffing and, you know, basically everything that we're um, uh, staff and contracted personnel and, and any, anything that's involved in just maintaining the land that we have. And so that we've been sticking to that so that the rest of it can be used for um, acquisitions or capital improvements uh, or habitat restoration, things like that. Um, you know, we, we are always on the lookout to try to identify new revenue sources. Um, you know, I'm always, anytime we do a capital improvement project, you know, I try to, you know, um, look for um, development impact fees to use. And then, you know, I have tried, you know, occasionally have tried <laughs> over the years to use a little bit more of the ag lease revenue for program expenses. That's a little more complicated, but um, I'm still, you know, every budget cycle, I still have discussions about that to try to see if there's a way to use a little bit more of the ag lease revenue to support um, the program. Mm -hmm. uh, this year, uh, just because of COVID and, uh, you know, the budget impacts that we had last year, um, I didn't ask for a lot of um, additional funding, but we did have, you know, we did have some um, funding left over from the North Davis Uplands project and that, uh, so we asked that that be carried over. So we did carry that over to this year, about $35,000. And then we asked for additional um, 10,000. So that was, this would be actually, um, I'm trying to get that to be an actual, you know, ongoing addition uh, because um, as we talked about previously, um, that hedgerow, you know, at the cannery farm needs to be maintained. And we've been, um, you know, working with the YOLO Resource Conservation District to help us um, maintain that hedgerow. And so we did, I did ask for that and we did, we did get um, ten, another 10,000 for, um, for that purpose. So that was good. Um, so then here's kind of um, what the budget looks like for this. So this is the budget for this year. And so you can see again, you know, a little bit of ag lease revenue. Um, again, the open space development impact fees, the park maintenance fees, and you can see the general fund and Measure O. Measure O, as you can see, is about a little over half of the budget. Um, and um, the general fund, uh, you know, is now down to about 30% of the budget. Um, so uh, that's why, you know, any, if we, do have trouble, you know, some years with the general fund, then, you know, in order to sort of keep, keep that baseline budget where it needs to be, I need to kind of make that up somewhere else, either with measure O or ag lease revenue or something, but, but we're doing pretty well now. So that's why, you know, this is the, this is what's in the, the budget document now, which this is pretty typical of, of past years. Um, this is just, a pie chart kind of showing that visually. I mostly just have this just up on the website so the public can just kind of visually see the breakdown of the program re revenues and how, you know, the major categories of where everything is spent. And then for expenses, um, again, um, it's kind of hard to see. I think I'll skip ahead to this for a second here. This is just a little bit easier to see. Um, you can see that um, about 41% is for personnel um, and then 30% is for, for, for right now, for in our budget now, 30% is for capital improvements and that's mostly for our projects um, at the North Davis Uplands 
and for um, South Fork Preserve. And then about 22% is for um, maintenance, supplies, equipment, that kind of thing. And so you can see um, here just sort of how it's broken down in the two different programs. And you can also see for Measure O, it looks like, yeah, Measure O is, you know, about 300 something, a little over 300,000 that uh, Measure O contributes to um, the program with about 126,000 of that going to self work preserve for the public accessibility improvements. So that's kind of how that breaks down. Um, and then these, again, I won't go through all of these. You can look at them at your leisure. Again, they're mostly when I put them up on the website for um, the public to know, but these are, again, you know, relate, we, this is what we sort of presented again to the city council about what's in the work plan and what we're going to focus on for the coming year. So it's, it's nothing really different. It's the same as uh, what we've been kind of talking about with the city council this year and what's in the work plan. So, um, you know, what acquisitions we're going to focus on and trying to, trying to complete the North Davis uplands and trying to, uh, work on maybe trying to install a hedgerow somewhere under habitat restoration. And then um, for land and resource management, um, you know, we're trying to work on that signage project and the land management plan for South Fork Preserve, um, public access, trying to finish South Fork Preserve, which we're almost done, and the North Davis um, uplands and getting those interpretive signs installed. Um, Program and financial accountability. Again, we like. I, I still would really like to try to work on that interactive open space map and get that um, in better shape on the city's website. Um, and then public engagement. You know, we're trying to partner right now with UC Davis on a habitat restoration project. So um, again, just continuing to build relationships with different um, entities. We actually just recently a couple of weeks ago, entered into a MOU with the Friends of North Davis Channel because they are helping, even though that's not technically an open space, um, open space helps uh, maintain the habitat restoration that happened there on the slopes of that channel. And so we've entered into an MOU with them, the open space um, program, Public Works and the Friends of North Davis Channel are partnering to um, maintain and enhance the habitat along um, a, a fairly large section of the channel. So that's just another partnership um, that we um, are, have added to our um, list of groups that we're working with. So then the fund balances. So basically what fund balance means is, you know, we have the budget, which is, is the money that we use uh, for like the, on, the projects that we know about and the ongoing things that we're doing. But then there are fund balances, meaning there are these accounts that are available um, for, for um, open space purposes that we could use, say for example, if um, an acquisition came up or um, a special project. Like for example, I think about like, if I did finally get, um, going on the sign project that I'd like to do with putting new signage in all our open space areas, you know, that would be um, a large uh, capital improvement. And so these are the, so if I wanted to do that, you know, I'm not, I wouldn't be able to, you know, ask for general fund for that. And so if I wanted to do something like that, these are some of the funds that I could request um, to do kind of a, a larger project like that, or say it's an acquisition of a conservation easement or, or a fee title land somewhere that we wanted to acquire for some reason. Um, these would be the funds that would be available for that purpose. So we've got um, Measure O, which is you know, up to almost 7 million now in that um, fund. And then we have a little bit of ag mitigation in lieu fees that um, were, 
still sitting from previous years when we when um, we we haven't done in lieu fees for a long time. So these are probably pretty old dollars, but we have 272,000 of those still left. Um, and then we have development impact fees, which I said, um, you know, some of those are going into our budget this year um, to help pay for the improvements at South Fork Preserve and for um, the North Davis Uplands. So altogether, you know, we have almost 9 million, which um, is pretty good. Um, and so that's just something to keep in mind that that's uh, in addition to kind of the, the baseline amounts that we need to um, uh, just, you know, like I said, maintain what we have. The, the, thing, the, the thing that is always sort of the, um, the limiting factor, shall we say, is uh, staff because of course that's always the hardest thing to get um, additional staff because because of course that's an ongoing obligation for the city um, and so um, that's kind of the limiting factor in that you know there's only um, there's just Chris and myself and 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 he's full time but I'm actually not full time on on the open space program I have another another duty for the city that takes up a lot of my time as well. And so um, that's, I would say, kind of the limiting factor is, you know, we do have funds, but in terms of uh, time and staff, that's always where we struggle because we always think, oh, you know, if we just had one more body, you know, <laughs> we could get a little bit more done. So that can be frustrating sometimes because some things that I'd like to happen faster than they are happening um, they just, um, you know, they don't just because we don't have enough, um, staff, but, um, anyway, that at least shows you how, you know, the, that there are some funds available for open space projects. And then the measure of fund itself, you know, once, you know, in 2015, when, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of, um, knowledge in the community, or even there wasn't a lot of um, transparency about the Measure O Fund and what it had been spent on over the last 15 years. And, um, you know, and so that was one of my priorities when I started was like, let's figure that out and put it in a spreadsheet and just keep track of it every year. And so, um, you know, so this is, um, this is where things stand at the moment. And then you can kind of see over time, you know, in, in the total column, you can kind of see over time, you know, uh, this measure O is a 30 year tax that started like about in 2001, it'll go to about 2030. Um, but you can kind of see in the total column, you know, what, what, how much has come in and what has been spent in these various categories over the last, you know, 17 years or so. Um, well, I guess, yeah, I guess it's more than that. Yeah. Um, I guess it's almost 20 years, but um, so, and you can see there down at the bottom that that is what is in the, the fund balance about 7 million, like I said previously. Um, and then, uh, but you can see for this budget, um, what we have kind of um, budgeted for personnel and maintenance and overhead and capital improvements. So for a total of 304,432 that we would be, that we are expecting to spend out of the Measure O fund this year. Um, and then this is just a visual of that 304,000 and how it gets allocated between those categories. Um, that's just kind of a visual. And then this kind of shows, again, showing that we're staying under the 33%, that 26%. That, that so if you go back to the spreadsheet, you can see up at the very top, the parcel tax. So it's expected that 685,000 will come in from the parcel tax. And so of that amount, you know, 26 percent will be spent on maintenance. So we're under the 33% that we said. 
And then we have 18% that would be spent on capital expenditures. And then the balance will go, to, will go back into building the fund for which is, which could be used for future acquisitions and capital improvements. And then in terms of staff, this kind of shows you um, what staff has, ha what staff have been paid out of the Measure O fund over um, the years. And you can see there was a little bit of a, an uptick last year because um, last year, everybody, you know, every department had to cut 10% um, because of the pandemic, pandemic related problems that the city was having. So, um, so in order to do that and not, you know, really be impacted, we, we, we bumped up, um, the percentages for, so my, my, the percentage of, of me bumped up to 20 from 10 to 20%. And the percentage of Chris, the open space lands manager bumped up from 50 to 60%. And you can see this year they've bumped back down again. So, um, so now I'm back at 10 and he's back at 50. And then we have a temporary part-time person, Amanda, who helps Chris and um, Measure O pays for 50% of her. And so that, that's all the staff that is paid for um, with the Measure O funds. And I think that is it. So, um, that is my presentation. So I'm, I'm very happy to answer any questions that you have. And if I don't know the answer, I can um, always uh, get back to you and let you know the answer later. <laughs> so I hope that was uh, informative and not too boring. <laughs> Tracy, we always love the annual budget review. I know, I know, Patrick, it's your favorite. It's, your <laughs> it's favorite my favorite time of, of year. year. Wow. Um, yeah, I think only people that have had to put together budgets and operate under them can appreciate them. <laughs> it's really tough. Well, but that's life. Yeah. I appreciate it, Tracy. Um, one, one thing I was um, looking at um, with the restricted funds balance is I think it might be um, potentially uh, useful to, um, if you could put at some point a graph together of that and look at it over time and you know how we get to the nine million dollars that we have right now whether it's a certain event that happened or if it's just a steady accumulation um you know i, I think that it's going to be important for us to figure out what to do in the next couple of years with that nine million dollars um you know a i don't want to just sit on a bunch of money um when we can be doing projects and b uh, with uh, a measure O renewal at some point. We don't want to just be sitting with a huge uh, fund balance that we haven't spent. Uh, so I just want to think about that. Um, and I think that a, a graph like that might would be useful for me to, to better understand what's going on with that accumulation of funds. Okay. I, I think Does that make sense, Tracy, what I'm, what I'm describing? Yeah, I think so. You know, kind of showing just over time, over time, what those each balance, one of them, like how, yeah, right. I mean, but yeah. each of those three different funds, you know, whether they're mm -hmm. growing, whether they're static or whatever. I, right. You know, Patrick, I had kind of the same idea. I saw that, uh, you know, for 21, 22, we're going to put aside, you know, more than half of what measure I've, right. I've bought. So at some point, uh, I, hopefully we have a good reason to, uh, you know, use it and put it to good use because if not, then, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and you know, it, it always just depends on what opportunities are out there. Obviously right. we can't just, you know, right. spend $9 million to spend it, but, um, no. you know, it's some, the further that builds up, the, the higher the pressure is going to be for us to, to do something with it. And the at, least the, at least the seven million for Measure O. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And the, the larger it gets, the more of a target it is for <laughs> to yep. be spent in other other ways. <laughs> yeah, high rates. High rated. Um, um, I I found uh, uh, kind of a good thing that uh, Chris is finally get some help, and uh, you know I I met that person when I was 
helping on the South Fork Preserve the other day, and uh, she seemed like a, a good person. And I hope that you know it 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 helps in resolving some of those bottlenecks we have on you know actually doing work out there. Yeah, he really needed he we haven't he hasn't had somebody for um, like almost two years. So yeah. so that that's that's a good good thing. So Tracy, I, I have a question. Um, would it be possible to use any of the any of the funding for the program um, in a in a contract or an agreement to have kind of discrete services done for the for the program that you can't do? And I'm thinking back to the to the um, workshops and everything that that you that you guys did back in probably 2016, 2017, when you hired a consultant to, to do kind of the 15, 15 year check-in and with the community about the open space program, is it, is it possible to do that? You have to go to the city council and get approval, you know, to, to do something like that? Yeah, no, that's definitely possible. I mean, sort of how it works is um, at the beginning of the year, you know, like in February, um, you know, if we know, if I know of something that I'm going to need money for, I would request it and it would get in the budget. But of course, not everything is anticipated. And so like during the year, if something comes up, um, I can, I can always request it. I just have to, you know, go back to the city council and request a budget adjustment. And um, so, yeah, something like that, um, uh, a discrete like process. the signage signage like say like say if I want to do the signage or something that could be I don't know I have no idea how much that's going to cost I could put a placeholder in the budget but it probably would be wrong and so when it came if we did something like that and it came in higher yeah I can go back to the city council and request a budget adjustment yeah great so we can hire subcontractors if we need to to do yeah some, to do discrete projects great great yeah Lindsay? Hey, yeah, thank you, Tracy, for that overview. It's really helpful and I'm still learning. So <laughs> I guess I'm trying to understand too, are there any sort of um, specific sort of limit, like time limits on any of the like, appro like appropriations that like, you know, certain years that the funds have to be spent by or like any specific, any encumbrances that we have to be aware of, like for any of the remaining funds? Um, so on the, on the, so when things that are in the budget, so if, if I, if I don't spend everything in my budget, um, I usually, uh, have to request it again. I, I usually, you know, lose it, right? But I then I just request it again. It, it's a little. I would say that it's not really a problem, except for the general fund dollars. Um, so you know, the city council, you know, understands Measure O, and you know, they, you know, um, are, you know, usually when I go ask them for additional measure O funding for a project, you know, they approve it. Um, they're more concerned about, you know, just impacts the general fund. So that's why usually when I do make a budget request, um, I don't um, usually ever ask for any more general funds um, than I already have. Um, so, but there's no, I mean, the only restrictions are, you know, there are restrictions on measure O, like what measure O can be spent on, you know, that's an actual, like, um, um, is it an ordinance? I forget. It's an actual tax, you know, it was approved by the voters. And so there's text that went along with what was approved. And so there are restrictions for that in terms of, you know, it has to be spent on basically acquisitions and maintenance of open space. Um, but none of the, but um, none of these, um, I'm trying to think if there are anything, any sort of 
restrictions on any of these. Not that I can think of. Um, they don't, I mean, obviously Measure O runs, it has to be renewed or canceled in 2030. But other than that, um, uh, I, no, I can't think of any sort of time limits or anything like that. Thank you. We probably should take public comment unless, oh, unless, okay. Just unless, shut your hand up. Okay. Oh, no, that's okay. Mine's more of a discussion thing than okay. clarification. So okay. if we can do public comment first, I'll wait. Okay. Well, Ira is still here. He doesn't have his hand up, but he does still have talking permitted. So, um, okay. Ira, are you still here? And is, is there anything that, anything, any questions or any comments that you'd like to have on our the budget um, presentation? I think he's probably muted, by the way. So you can you can um, take uh, Denise if you can um, take Bri Ira's. Um, I don't think he wants to say anything. So you can take his talking talking off. Okay, I'll take his talk now. Thank you. He probably muted it and was eating his dinner or something. Um, okay, so let's open it up then to just, just general discussion and any further questions, um, any further questions that folks might have? Yeah, I still, I still have mine, if that's all right. Yeah, go right ahead then. All right, so I guess um, I understand that council understands Measure O. Do, do you, I'm, I'm not that confident that the public understands that this is a fixed tax. It doesn't have any sort of inflationary change to it, but the cost of implementing it does have that. And so this sort of fixation on the 33% maintenance seems sort of, I don't know, questionable to me that, you know, we're acquiring more assets that require maintenance, which costs more and more as time goes on. So how can we possibly um, stick to that restriction over time? Right. That's a good question. Um, so, so, and I think my answer would be that, I mean, so far, you know, we have been able to, we haven't added a, a lot more than we had before. And I think also the way Chris maintains things, um, you know, he, by again, he, we have contracts, you know, he has some help uh, with some of the other, with some properties, but like, for example, we have added F, the North Davis uplands, that's three acres, which is, has taken up a lot of time. You know, we have added the 10 acres that are west of South Fork Reserve. We've added um, the, uh, the Cannery Hedgerow. Um, you know, and all of those have made a, a, an impact and we've edged up a little bit and we've, we've, but we've still have been able to kind of stay there. Now, if we did say, for example, like, let's just say, for example, for some reason, you know, at some point in the future, we take on the wetlands. Now that's 400 acres. So like, clearly we would never be able to satisfy that. So in my mind, what I've always thought was, well, when we get to that point, when we when we get to the point where, you know, we have tried, you know, we've tried and we, we just, we just can't either we have to hire more staff or we have to do something right. We'll, we'll have to go back to the city council and explain how we're going to, you know, how we are uh, going to exceed that 33%. But, you know, you know, I'm, I'm hesitant to, you know, if we're, we are going to do that, I want to have a really, you know, big reason for 
doing it for violating it because you know when i first started here there was a lot well there was i don't know if it was widespread but there was a definite uh group of people who were very very upset about um you know how much of the parcel tax was going towards maintenance and personnel and so, you know, we made that pledge at the time and said, you know, we're really going to work hard to, you know, keep it at a third. Now, you're right. Eventually, it may be that we're just not going to be able to do that. And we'll have to, you know, deal with that. And we'll have to make our arguments. You know, I would make our arguments in a public session before the city council and just say, you know, we're just not going to be able to do that. Um, and here are the reasons why. So, I mean, it's a good point. And, um, but for now, you know, the last, I mean, it's only been, you know, maybe the last five or six years where we've been making that pledge and we've still been able to stick to it. So, you know, in five years, will that be still true? I don't know. You know, we'll have to see. Yeah, well, I think as that, you know, seven million dollars gets spent down it's going to get harder and harder and you know just i hope you know that i'll support you in that public arena for sure. <laughs> i won't yeah, speak I mean, for think, the other know, commissioners but i will be there tracy <laughs> <laughs> well i thank you Trent. i mean yeah and i think you know the whole point would be to be transparent about it right and and explain yeah. why and if there are real good reasons then then there are good reasons but i think the 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 problem was that it was sort of it wasn't transparent and you know um so that just led people to think that you know it was being misspent which of course you know we didn't want that and it wasn't being misspent but that people thought that because there was too much secrecy about it mm -hmm. um yeah. but transparency is so important yeah. yeah um but you know these acquisitions i mean you know again if we buy easements we don't have a lot of costs associated with that other than the acquisition right we don't the 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 the, um, the percentage really goes up when we add property that we have to actually maintain ourselves. You know, fee title land that we actually have to maintain ourselves. And that that's a little harder. That's a little harder to come by. Um, but that's where the the that percentage really goes up. Like for example, if the open space program had to take over the wetlands or something. And, uh, so. And, and I think also public access and uh, is also a factor that is desired, but which also increase cost and maintenance and mm -hmm. that too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any more questions or comments for discussion? Well, great. Thank you so much, Tracy, because as um, the, did somebody want to chime in? Well, it, it's just barely related, but I was just curious about the signage at the South Fork. Are we close to having it or because we're talking about having, a, a, you know, an opening with the city council and all that, will, will that be ready or not yet? Well, it, uh, that's the plan. I think I'm hoping that you know, the, the first, these first two weeks of November, uh, it should arrive. And I've already um, alerted the Sacramento Conservation Corps to get them ready to um, install them uh, the first couple right. weeks of November. So that's the plan. Good. I just wanna say uh, thanks, Tracy. Uh, again for uh, putting all these numbers together. I know it takes uh, some work and also thanks for uh, you know managing the program so that we get uh, good numbers to look at here. Um, you know it, it's nice to be sitting on almost nine million dollars to do something. So uh, I think our next step is to actually do something with that nine million dollars and figure out what some uh, big new projects are going to be. but I think that we're all kind of thinking about that and working on it but mm -hmm. Um, just uh, basically just, just thanks and I think that we're in good shape right yeah agreed definitely for sure 
Okay. Um, that concludes our regular items for tonight. So we can move on then to commission and staff communications, item seven on our agenda. And um, the first one is the, um, the commission work plan. And, and um, I'm not sure exactly what you want us to, or what you, what you want us to discuss at that point. Um, it sort of seems redundant to the reporting of the working groups to me, but I know this is a, is a template from the city. So <laughs> I know I should ask the city clerk about that. Like, what do you want on? I know I'll ask the city clerk. Cause I'm yeah. kind of confused about it myself. Yeah. Because the, you know, the, to me, the commission work plan would be just a brief thing with the working groups, with the working groups reporting, if they've done anything. And, uh, and that's just, you know, a few, few dots down. So, um, we do, let's skip that for then for now. Um, we do have an upcoming, uh, our last meeting of the year is gonna be December, um, I believe it's the 5th or 6th, December 6th. Six. And um, now's the time to, to talk about the things that we might wanna have on the agenda for that meeting. Um, and uh, if you have anything already slated for that meeting, Tracy, the only other thing I can think of to put on the, on, on that would be the the DISC 2022 project EIR if people are even remotely interested in looking at you know looking over the um, addendum to that and then um, we had talked about the possibility of asking Chris to give a just a brief presentation about the status of the status of any habitat um, any habitat damage um, going on in in city open spaces from from uh, um, homeless encampments with the, you know, the, the concern about the Putta Creek Parkway in South Davis in, in particular, but also other, other open spaces throughout the city that the, the program is responsible for maintaining that are, that are being impacted by fire or, or other things from, from, uh, from camping. Those are the two things I can think of. Yeah, the, the three things on my list were the um, cannery farm lease, like I already mentioned. And mm -hmm. then, yeah, if, if the commission wanted to have a discussion about the Puda Creek Parkway or just, you know, the impact of camps on open space areas in general, mm -hmm. and then um, DISC, which I'm not the EIR, the addendum, the addendum to the EIR, which, you know, may or may not be available at that time? I'm not quite sure the timing of it. Well, let's talk about that. Do, are there any commission members that want to review the EIR addendum for the, for the DISC 2022 revised project, revised proposal, revised project? Anybody, anybody in particular have a strong interest in looking at, at that? Okay. I don't see any. I would. Who spoke up? Me and Sarah. Sarah, okay. Um, okay. Tracy can let you know when it's when it's a, when it's available. She could let us know when it's available. Um, I it's a um, it's a it's a big project on the east side of town that's been in the works for several several years now and it's already gone to the voters once and um and been been um voted down by not that many not that many votes were you here when the when were you in town when it happened a couple of years ago yes i'm following it okay so you're familiar with it and um we can, we can definitely let Tracy can definitely let you know when when it's available. I I am particular I am not interested in relooking at the the EIR addendum. Um, but if you would like to like to have a look at it when it comes out, that would be great. Does anybody else feel strongly about 
putting it on putting it on agenda for now, now Sarah are you asking just personally for yourself personally or do you want it to be placed on the agenda and have uh, a discussion among the commission members I think it'll depend on what I read <laughs> okay yeah I wonder if it'll come out in time for us to really have a meaningful discussion yeah I, I kind of doubt it that's yeah, good. I'm Dang. thinking maybe January. Maybe we could push it to January if we still have the 30 days. We could probably. It really depends on when it comes out. I mean, it seemed like it, what was the earliest date, December 1st or 2nd or something like that? It's a, yeah. I mean, best case yeah. scenario is a few days before our meeting. And, uh, you know, even that seems uh, pretty tight. Um, you know, I, I don't have a, a great need to review it, but I understand, uh, you know, Sarah's interest in doing that since uh, she hasn't been part of this process uh, like some of the others of us have over the past few years. Yeah. And I would just note, and you guys probably already know this, but it, it, it's, it's um, the addendum is really just, it's kind of doing what the commission did at our last meeting, which is looking at the EIR that already has been certified and pulling out what's still relevant. So it's not gonna be analyzing anything new. It's just looking at the previous EIR and saying, okay, this, because of course the project is smaller than what was analyzed under the EIR. Mm -hmm. And so it's basically, you know, gonna explain if the previous EIR was still good and if it you know what parts of it are applicable to the new project so i just guess i wanted to yeah. clarify that it's not going to be analyzing any anything new really okay well let's uh could I, sorry could i ask what the end goal is with our involvement in this is this like whether we recommend it to be voted in the future or now we also we already have put forward to the city council our revised recommendations on on the cannery project on the not the cannery project the disc 2022 project proposal that was done at our last meeting um so this is basically just for our own our own interests or um if we if there are very specific things that we are looking looking for in the eir that we might want to make an additional comment or two to the to the city council, but we've already put forward our recommendation our recommendations. Everybody's. Other commissions are doing other commissions are in the process of doing their recommendations now now too. Okay, well let's uh let's shoot for January then. If it comes out early enough to 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 do in December, we could do that, but um Let's just keep it on a in a back burner there for a little bit. Hold on to it. And um, how does everybody feel about about addressing the issue that was brought up by the member, uh, but by Ms. Dewitt last meeting about um, looking at the issue of camping and the impacts of camping in some of the city's open space? Do you want to agendize that and get a presentation? And how would you like to frame it, Mark? Well, I, you know, I, I, I was not there, but, you know, we hear from concert citizens and I think it'd be interesting to me to get some kind of an assessment uh, from Chris or somebody that, you know, knows and understand what the, you know, the, the actual damage is uh, to see if that's really something that, um, you know, requires some action or that would be kind of my way of looking at it. I don't know what the other members think. Sarah? I agree, I'd like to hear about this. I'd also like input maybe from, I believe there's homeless services in the city and what they know about, well, what they know about this to get more of a nuanced, mm -hmm perspective not just um like how it's potentially destroying or impacting the land but also 
why <laughs> they're there, or why they choose certain places, and is there a long-term goal for the people who live there um, to find better housing? Obviously, better housing. I see who, who in the city coordinates homeless services now? Well, so um, can you, can you, is the agenda back up? Yeah. Okay. Um, um, so I don't know if everybody heard, but um, the city just recently established a new department. Um, it's kind of like, um, I forget what it's called. I think it's even like called the Department of Social Services or something. And it's meant to kind of coordinate some of these uh, services, mental health, homelessness, um, you know, other social services, rental resources. Um, it's meant to sort of coordinate all of that. Um, and it actually even is, in, is um, it's not going to be a huge department, but it, it will result in two net new um, positions. Um, and so, um, Right now, there's nobody really doing that, but there is somebody within the police department, although he's he's since left and they need to replace him, but there's a dedicated person in the police department who is respond. He's like a homeless, he's actually a homeless outreach person where he goes and, um, you know, actually tries to connect people with uh, resources. And it's actually a police officer that does that, but you know, he's not really, I mean, he is a police officer, but his job is really to try to connect, um, connect the people to resources. So we do have that going on, but like I said, now there's this reorganization. Um, I don't know, like, for example, to Sarah's point, I'm not exactly sure at this moment in time who I might invite to talk about that. Um, but I could try to see if there's somebody, um, there probably is somebody who could talk about it a little bit. Um, uh, Chris would probably also be able to talk about who he, who he coordinates with in the city yeah. um, when there are issues as well. So he could, he could probably refer to that. Because, yeah. I mean, he, he coordinates because, with the city, he coordinates with the police department for the camp cleanups. Yeah. But he doesn't, he's not really involved in like trying to connect right. people to resources. But, right. but also, you know, I understand your concern, Sarah, but I feel it's not the purview of this commission to, you know, deal with the homelessness. What I would be mostly interested in is that, is that something that we should really be concerned about as, you know, open space commission or, or you know, um, I, that's the way I see it, I think, as a first step, at least. Uh, Patrick, you had your hand up as well. Yeah, thanks, Carrie. Um, yeah, I, um, I, I definitely think that um, we should take this on as an agenda item. It, it's certainly the, uh, the topic that I think that we've received the most uh, interest in as a commission over the past three or four months. So I think that, um, you know, we uh, somewhat owe it to the the uh, Davis citizens to to take this up and see if we uh, at least learn more about it uh, at a minimum, uh, but maybe come up with a recommendation to council for what we see as uh, how to to think about uh, potential impacts on open space features. Um, it, I think that it might be uh, useful uh, and on Sarah's point to have um, you know, someone uh, reporting not just on the open space uh, impacts, but, uh, you know, give us a, a little broader view of uh, the issues and, and how we might uh, frame a recommendation to council if we want to go that route. Lindsay, how about, what, how about you? Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I mean, I think that it's, that we should be responsive to the public input as it's sort of the objective of the commission. But I do really agree with what Mark Mark's sort of framing of having Chris sort of do an assessment and, you know, he's the person out there that sort of knows what's happening. And so I think I'd be open to his input and guidance on sort of 
framing the presentation or update to us um, and not sort of us sort of telling him how to bring it the issues to us but just sort of communicating that this is what we've we've received a lot of public comment on the issue and if you could just brief us on what we need to know and maybe it could include some of those broader perspectives at a later time if that's necessary um, but yeah keeping it within the scope of the purview of the commission I agree with that approach okay thank you any other comments because I think I I agree I think with Mark and Lindsay that at least as a first step, let's hear from, from Chris Gardner, who manages these lands and get his perspective on what the scale and scope of the issue is, and then and then make some decisions from there if we need to, if we need to. Um, so yeah, I think we've got um we've got kind of a consensus then that we'd like, if possible, for Mark to just give us a maybe maximum 15 minute presentation um, at the next commission meeting, just about you know, the challenges that he he's facing with, um, with uh, habitat, you know, damage to habitat and um, ability for him to work, work safely in the open space areas um, and what he sees as opportunities, um, opportunities to improve things, I think for everybody and for everybody involved. Yes. Okay. I can definitely talk to him about that. Okay, cool. Okay. Moving on then. Um, I think those three things, those things for the December meeting would be fine. Um, so I, I have two, I have the cannery farm lease and then this, uh, Chris okay. presentation. Okay, great. All right. Does any anybody on the commission have any um, upcoming events that you'd like to like to share with the rest of the commission members, Tracy? I don't have any. Okay. And I don't think we need to have an update on the cannery farm since we talked about that for quite a wait, quite a long time tonight. So I think we're good there. What about the working yes. groups? Oh wait, sorry about that. If that fell below my, I, I'm still. I don't know about you guys, but every time somebody, every time somebody puts a presentation up or changes a presentation, my screen gets completely messed up, and that was hanging below my, <laughs> out of view. Um, yeah, working working groups. Let me go through these really quickly. Trisha, Trish, do you do you want to give a little short pre present, little short uh, uh, talk about what we what we accomplished in the our subgroup, our working group, and I'll look up the official names of all of our other groups. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I think we're talking about the uh, I don't know, equity group, um, and Emma. Uh, Carrie and I met last week and went to a SWOT analysis. We It was a really productive conversation. I think we identified a lot of strengths and a lot of opportunities, a few weaknesses and a few challenges. Um, we are going to meet again in the next couple of weeks to sort of prioritize those and um, really uh, settle on some goals and action items. And then we have... Um, these are, and just so, so Sarah's familiar, we have several working groups. We have six standing working groups in the commission. And currently we have one kind of ad hoc um, working group that's working on a very specific kind of a specific task. And that's what Tr Tricia was just um, talking about is a small working group um, that's working on um, diversity, equity, and kind of inclusion issues related to the acquisitions and easements and other aspects of the program, especially with relate, related to beginning farmers and under-resourced farmers and things of that nature. Um, but we have six standing um, six standing work groups and I'll, uh, I'll go through them. And if anybody, if any of the leaders wants to um, report on work that's been done in the last month, feel free. Um, the acquisitions working group. 
That'd be Patrick. Uh, yeah, I don't think that we have had anything over the, the past month on acquisitions. Okay. Okay. And then we have a habitat restoration and enhancement working group, which um, Sherman McFarland, our, our uh, a previous commission member was kind of the leader of, and Tricia has sort of stepped into that role. Anything on that, anything on that group this past month? No, there okay. hasn't. Cool. So I, I'm part of that and I'll, I'll throw in a couple of things that are kind of tangential that might be of interest to the commission here, okay. which, um, and this is uh, a review for uh, uh, standing commission members, but Sarah, also for you, um, I'm the city's representative on the Lower Puda Creek uh, Coordinating Committee. And so it's the, the group of jurisdictions that is, uh, serves as a steering committee to the stream keeper on, on Puda Creek and guides uh, kind of restoration and management of the creek. And so we've had a couple of things lately that have gone towards um, salmon restoration on the creek, one of which is there was an illegal dam put in a while ago up um, upstream of winters, but it, um, it closed off um, some um, habitat for salmon spawning for a mile or two uh, below um, the Puda Creek Diversion Dam. And that has been resolved and that dam has been removed. So that um, opens up that um, area for uh, additional salmon spawning uh, starting uh, this season. Um, so that's good news on the, the upstream end. And then uh, on the downstream end, uh, basically what happens is where Puda Creek hits uh, the Yolo Bypass, there's a seasonal check dam that's in place uh, that prevents um, fish movement up and downstream. And um, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife pulls those boards out at some point in the fall. Um, last year, um, they pulled them out pretty late. Um, they leave them in to do flood up for waterfowl on the bypass. But what it did was uh, prevented uh, a number of weeks of salmon access to Puda Creek. And I think that it greatly diminished the salmon spawning that we saw last year, unfortunately. But um, we've come to a good agreement with them. Um, I think that the check dam should be um, out in the last couple days, uh, right around now. And we're moving forward with um, looking for funding to build a permanent solution to that that involves a, kind of a, a fish ladder sort of situation around that check dam. So I, um, we're, we're progressing towards the check dam being much less of an issue and the date of its uh, change. So that's also uh, good news on the lower end. So I think that we'll have um, you know, a better um, more stable access to the full uh, Puda Creek for uh, spawning salmon in the future. That's cool. Yeah, and in, in addition to those those boards being pulled on that check dam, they also increased the flows out of the diversion dam and um, for salmon for salmon mm -hmm. attraction. So there'll yep. be some nice fresh, nice fresh clean cold water. I hope coming down. Uh, the creek and helping to pull salmon out of the toe drain and up into the into the creek. Now we just have to deal with those beavers. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. A, a different question, but uh, always an issue. Uh, the beaver dams along the creek. Right, exactly. Um, and then we also have Sarah. We also have a land and resource management working group, um, which um, Emma. Torbert has been kind of the leader of with, with, um, with Sherman, who's now been taken over by Patricia. So um, we'll let, we'll let um, Emma talk about that when she gets here the next month. We also have a, a public engagement and partnerships um, working group that Ramiro is um, the leader of, and he's not here tonight either. Um, but um, Lindsay, is there anything from, from this past month that you that you need to report or want to talk about from that group? No, just celebrating sort of what Tracy's efforts with the survey. So thanks, Tracy, for the update there. Super. But the working group has not met. Super. Okay. Um, we also have a the the um, a public access and recreation work group, which you're which you lead, Lindsay. And yeah, there's 
been no activity, but Tracy and the program is, have been chugging along doing great work. So thanks. Cool. And then last but not least, we have this, we have a financial and program accountability um, working group, Sarah, that I, I am on and Mark Bessier, who's our vice chair is also on that. And again, we haven't met, we have not met either. There's no report for that working group. Um, let's see. Um, and that, and again, the last thing on this list is always the cannery farm. So um, I don't think there's any anything about the cannery farm unless somebody has any lasting comments or questions from our discussion earlier this evening. Well, the last thing is the update on the climate action. Oh, yeah. yeah, climate action is after that. Add, okay, yeah, I have a little update for that, so. Good, okay. No, no, in, no lingering comments about, no lingering concerns about the update about the cannery farm. Okay, climate action and adaptation plan update. Well, just, I just quick, well, just, I, I think um, you all got this email, but I just wanted to mention that um, the, you know, the action item, there's, I think there's 25, I can't remember, I think there's 25, there's 25 action items now that, that the um, consultant and the, and, and with community feedback have come to, uh, have settled on and right now uh, the city is looking for feedback generally on those um, action items and so there's going to be a um, a workshop to uh, get that feedback on November 10th at five and it's a, it's a zoom it's a zoom meeting so um, it's basically to get the community input on the draft proposed actions and so if you want to go to that, you can go to the, the CAP website um, for more information and the Zoom meeting link is, is on the um, CAP webpage there. And then also, I guess there's a companion, uh, there's a related community forum website where uh, residents can comment on the actions as well. So if you, for example, you can't go to the November 10th meeting at five, for whatever reason, there's another way that you can provide comment um, through this, this community forum website. And um, although it says that people are encouraged to visit the companion website prior to the November 10th workshop. So I don't know if maybe they're going to discuss some of the comments that have come in um, at the workshop. So if you can't go to the November 10th workshop, but want to comment, maybe try to log into that um, companion forum website and make your comment um, there so that uh, it can be discussed on November 10th. And I guess um, the, that, web, that companion one is www.daviscap.com. So .davisca.com. But I'm, I think it's also on the CAP website as well. I'm sure there's a link to it on the CAP website. So. I just wanted to make everybody aware of that because they're getting down to, you know, settling on the, the um, action items, at least the initial action items. Cool. Thank you, Tracy. Okay. Thanks. And anything else that anybody would like to say at this point before we adjourn the meeting tonight? Okay. Good meeting. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, and I adjourn the meeting. Six minutes early. Thank you, Carrie. I, <laughs> trying to make up for last time. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, All right. Thank you, Sarah. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Bye everyone. Good night. Good night. Yeah.